This house was built in 1796 by Christopher Manwaring, whose family first came to the United States uh, from London in 1660. The house that preceded this one that the Manwaring family lived in was burned uh, during the American Revolution by, by Benedict Arnold. He burned a lot of New London. So shortly after the war, he decided to put a, another house up in the same location. The house is a transitional home from uh, a, a Georgian home to a, a federal house. The federal period, a lot of the colors are more muted, but 20 years earlier, colors were very bright. And part of the reason was that the fireplaces were burning all the time, so you're going to get ash and soot over the paint anyway. So colors were very bright and vibrant. Christopher Manwaring was a local tanner, uh, a successful merchant in town, but later in life he ran for state office and became a state legislator. He was in the same party as James Madison, Andrew Johnson, and Andrew Jackson, and they were all here in this house according to the stories we've heard, and he was a particularly good friend of, of um, James and Dolly Madison. They were here, and they had brandy in the library. This house, in its original setting, was on top of a hill, the Man Wearing Hill, and therefore it had great views of the Thames River and, the, and Long Island Sound. So Mr. Man Wearing invited American naval officers up to the third floor, trapdoor through the third floor onto the roof, where they could observe the British blockade and then plan strategy for uh, getting around it. Between 1904 and 1967, the house was donated to New London as a hospital, and the hospital decided to use it instead as a nurse's dormitory. In mid-60s, the house was going to be uh, torn down, and a, a local uh, individual who worked at the Mystic Seaport uh, made an offer, apparently, and bought the house and dismantled it. He was going to re-erect it himself, so he did not make uh, detailed plans. He just had rough drawings of what each floor looked like, the front elevation, some, you know, um, indication about what size each elevation was. But he didn't do anything more formal than that because he was going to re-erect it right away. The bits and pieces of the house were stored in two states and five cities, various places where uh, Robert Tatro had friends who would store it for him. Their parts of the floors were even kept in chicken coops. He had an injury, uh, the, the building codes changed. Uh, the house was then moved by the University of Connecticut from these various locations to their property and stores Connecticut and put into a large Quonset hut. In 1994, they decided to sell the house. When we saw this house advertised in the newspaper, we, didn't, we were unaware of the fact that the house had been dismantled 28 years earlier in 1967 and stored. So we were hoping to go out and see the house, and instead we had to see piles of lumber in this unheated, unlit Quonset hut and have to take it on faith that the house had everything there that we saw in that newspaper article. My favorite novel has always been Moby Dick. To me, whaling is one of the parts of American history that is most fascinating. So when we saw this house and we saw that there were whale's tails on the... Uh, skirt board. Skirt board, I guess it's called. I had to have it. <laughs> And I kept, when we were in that Quonset hub, I kept saying, look at this, Don, whale's tails. And the paint will come right yeah, off. Look how it's flaking off. This would be so easy to remove. <laughs> I kept the telling him, no. just, it'll come right off. It won't be a problem. We, we knew that uh, to uh, commit ourselves to this project, we needed three things. We needed a contractor who was familiar with this type of a restoration. We needed a piece of property that would be suitable, that, would, that the house would fit in. 
And thirdly, we needed a house that was worthy of the effort we knew it was going to take. For, the, for a whole day, about a 15-hour day in February, we unloaded the contents of that Quonset hut uh, onto two semi-trailers that we had arranged to be out there. Uh, one was an enclosed uh, uh, trailer and the other was an open-end trailer. And so with this contingent of guys and a piece of equipment, we, laid, we loaded all of these 42-foot-long uh, beams and posts and uh, the, all of the bricks that were in the original two chimneys, all of the heavy uh, brownstone that uh, made up the front and side steps, all of the, the surrounds for seven, chimney, for seven fireplaces, granite and brownstone, into these two trailers. At the end of the day, then we dispatched them out to uh, Granville, Ohio. I had plans to meet the first one uh, two days later, and the next one was, I think, four days later. And um, so we inventoried, we made replacements, we repaired pieces, and then we had to strip paint. And, and, some, of the, and some of the moldings in the uh, downstairs here, uh, the crown molding is uh, 12 inches and it's composed of seven different moldings. And part of that is what we call matchstick molding, these little small matchsticks. And they were so covered with paint that you, could, you couldn't tell that those were individual. And so those had to be clear of paint. And so I had a screwdriver in which I would eliminate all that paint. And the screwdriver was new. It had a square end on it. And now it's rounded. I still have the screwdriver and it's shorter and it's really round. <laughs> doorknobs and locks were missing because in those five places where all the parts of the house were stored, and the house weighed 36 tons, by the way. When Don talks about moving it, it's 36 tons he moved. Uh, there, every day there were surprises because every day we would have to have executive decisions made. Because the house had no formal plans, when it was resurrected, we were going you know, we just didn't know how each room was going to look. Basically, the floorboards were a certain length, so we knew based on the floorboards how large the room was. This house uh, used material, used wood that was from a virgin forest in this country. Uh, wood that uh, was as good, and if not harder, uh, the day we put the house back together than when the forests were first cut back in the 18th century. So we had wonderful material to work with. Secondly, we had a house, even though we had hand-drawn diagrams of the dimensions, that was, that was designed, obviously, by some architect who had studied classical architecture going back to the time of ancient Rome and ancient Greece. So they knew the importance of, of correct proportions. So they knew that what was pleasing to the eye, how high should it be relative to the width, what should the window replacements be. So we had the benefit of this knowledge that goes back to ancient Roman and Greek times in terms of how the architecture designed the home that you really can't find today. For me, it's because people like James Madison walked these floors, opened these doors. To me, that means everything. It's, um, it's a piece of American history that we saved for future generations.